Thank you very much, Nigel. Very, uh, very sweet of you. Actually, um, I have to tell you, my family have told me that I learned to be stubborn when I was three years old. Uh, and, and they do tell uh, a pretty amazing story how I stood up to my father when I was three years old, which I will spare you this morning. Um, but um, I have actually learned now with my children to disrupt, to use Nigel's word, uh, disrupt a concept of stubborn. So we have collectively come to the conclusion that it's okay to be stubborn as long as it's for the common good. Um, and so now we've made it wonderful to be stubborn. So whenever anyone is stubborn in my family, I'm going, how many people are benefited by that stubbornness? And if there's a critical mass, it's fine. <laughs> so that's the way we're dealing with stubbornness. So anyway, welcome uh, to the family of stubborn uh, optimists that I want to invite you today uh, to become. I would like to share two points with you this morning. The first is uh, about decarbonization, and I would like to give you several proof points that Kristen has already started, uh, that decarbonization actually is already underway. It is unstoppable, it is irreversible, uh, and it is growing actually exponentially. And my second point today is going to be that despite all of that very good news, we're not decarbonizing fast enough yet. Actually, uh, the, well, I will give you some points about the latest scientific evidence that has come out over the past three years, and uh, I will propose a pretty radical and clear boundary of emissions within which we must operate for the rest of the century. So that's the executive summary. For those of you who only read the executive summaries, I'm done. You can now leave. If you want more details, here are the details. Uh, so to decarbonization. I warned you uh, that decarbonization is already underway. It is unstoppable and it is growing exponentially. So let me give you a couple of data points on that. First, I want to talk about uh, renewable energy, the most exciting story on the energy market. Certainly, uh, solar coming down 90% over the past eight to nine years in cost. Um, and it's actually become cheaper than any of us ever thought. Uh, and continues its uh, descent in price. So already in India, Peru, Mexico, UAE, uh, uh, Emirates, Chile, Morocco, uh, the price is already under $30 uh, the megawatt hour, three cents uh, the kilowatt hour, very exciting prices, making it very cost competitive with coal. Offshore wind also coming down, not at those prices of solar, but already offshore wind in the UK, where I am living now, uh, already at $57 uh, dollars the megawatt hour. So very, very competitive costs. And honestly, if anyone had asked, uh, even the IEA five years ago, will renewables ever be that cost competitive? The answer would have been no. The answer today is absolutely and Renewables have never been as expensive as they are right now because they will continue to descend in cost. Um, there also is more renewable energy on the global energy uh, matrix uh, than we ever imagined would be possible. Since 2015, we have added more renewable energy to the, uh, to the global grid than all other sources combined. And in fact, we have pretty certain uh, projections that all the incremental energy supply between now and 2021 is actually going to be non-fossil fuel. Uh, so that's actually an astonishing trend that we are beginning now to truly cement into the transformation of the energy grids uh, worldwide. So it's cheaper than we thought. There's more of it than we ever, uh, than we ever uh, thought, and it is actually happening faster than we expected from the point of view of individual countries. We already have 11 uh, European Union countries uh, that have met their 2020 uh, renewable energy targets. Uh, China, did you know, has already surpassed surpassed its 2020 solar target, and last I looked, it's only 2018. So they are two years early and already surpassed. India has done the same. India is now projecting that what they registered under the Paris Agreement, they can actually go 50% higher, and they will comply with that 
three years earlier uh, than they had thought because solar is so competitive against coal uh, in India. In fact, uh, India uh, recently announced that all government-owned ports in India are going to be 100% renewable energy powered by next year. So if you ever doubted the commitment of China in India, there you go. Uh, we have a hundred, uh, more than 100 cities around the world that are already running on 70% renewable energy, two times as much as we had last year. Uh, and as Nigel has already pointed out, a growing number of companies, I think at this point 122 companies, that are committed to going 100% renewable. So um, that decarbonization is happening much faster than we expected and everything is conspiring in a positive way uh, to actually accelerate that decarbonization even farther in an exponential way. So where does that leave coal? Well, coal is actually on the demise, on the decline. Uh, it is recently been included in CITES list of, uh, of species that are under extinction threat. Uh, it is uh, declining really right in front of our eyes. It's important to understand why. Coal is declining and is on the demise incontrovertibly because number one of the health effects. That's very important to understand. Because one of the tenets of the Paris Agreement is, yes, we have to do what we have to do for the globe. But first, what is the national interest? What is the local interest? And coal is the biggest threat to national interest because of its health implications. So because we're now understanding the health implications of coal, that is why the main reason but also risk that I will talk about, uh, coal is on the decline, mostly in China and India. The two countries that we thought were going to protect their uh, right to use coal, actually pre-construction coal is already uh, declining by almost 50%, by a 48% at this point. And overall, you can say that coal is losing both its social license Nobody wants a coal plant close to them because of, the, uh, because of the health implications. But also, coal is losing its competitiveness um, because of overbuild, because of competitiveness uh, cost against uh, renewables, and because of declining finance uh, for coal. The most amazing uh, recent story is the Adani coal mine in Australia that was going to be the largest coal mine in Australia, second largest in the world. Um, and they thought they would be able to open it. They thought they would be able to get the finance. Well, the fact is they did not get the finance from the Australian government that they needed. They did not get the money from the Chinese government that they needed. And, you know, things have gone relatively quiet on the Adani front. Uh, I just don't think that they'll be able to... Uh, to open that, uh, that mine, uh, and it has a huge domino effect because the coal from that mine was supposed to be taken on a big railroad over to the port owned by Adani also, a coal port, coal export and coal across, uh, across the, uh, the, the world over to uh, India to a coal plant, on and on and on. So, you know, a coal, coal domino uh, that because of the lack of financing, because investors have decided that it is too risky to begin at this point in time, 2018, to put fresh money into coal, an asset that is very clearly now a toxic asset uh, that has not gone forward. So... A very interesting case, uh, case in point there between Australia and India, two, uh, two countries that are really quite iconic uh, for coal. Um, and then, of course, we have a, a slew of accelerated retirements of coal, in this case, not coal mines, but coal plants, most of them in North America and uh, Europe also uh, for health reasons, but also uh, in addition because they're just simply too inefficient. They are, you know, more or less my age, many of them. Uh, and by this time, even I can't run a marathon. So, you know, the coal plants can't do it either. Uh, and it's about time to, uh, as I say it, you know, to thank coal uh, for everything that it has done. Because in the last century, 
much of the development that we had was thanks to coal. So it's time to thank coal, like a nice little old lady. Thank you very much. Honor it for everything you did. And it is time to send it to their retirement home. Um, and just to give you a couple of data points on finance, uh, uh, also, you know, the, uh, the, the, the risk, the understanding of risk uh, on the part of financial institutions is hugely growing on coal. Uh, we already have up to six uh, trillion dollars in investment. Eighty percent of pension funds have already uh, announced they're either out of coal or will come out of coal. Thank you to the Norwegian uh, fund for for moving in that direction, but I will also list Lloyds of London, ING, BMP Paribas, HSBC as commercial banks that have gotten out of coal. Um, and then the development banks, you know, when you say, well, it's actually the developing countries that still need coal, well, guess what? The World Bank, EBRD, EIB, and AIIB uh, have all said no more financing of coal. The list of countries that have already said they're not going to use coal anymore is long. Uh, I am not going to give you the long list. It's a long list. Um, here's a very interesting point. Insurance. If you ever wondered who are the risk gurus of this world? Well, it's the insurance companies, right? That's why we all give them our money, because they're supposed to understand risk better than ourselves, and they're supposed to manage that risk for us. Well, the insurance companies are now getting out of coal. So now when you have the insurance companies getting out of coal, now you really have a confirmation that that is a highly risky asset. And you, the list of insurance companies that are getting out of coal includes Allianz, AXA, Zurich, Swiss Re, um, and SCORE, um, all of them saying too risky, no more insurance uh, for coal. So how on earth is coal going to operate in a world where it doesn't have insurance, it's not getting finance, and nobody wants it in the backyard. I think it is time, as I said, to thank Cole and send it to the retirement home. Um, right, the other story, fantastic story on decarbonization, uh, which has exploded over the past uh, 12 to 18 months, is electric vehicles. Why is that important for decarbonization? Because that already signals a decline, not on coal, because they don't use coal, haven't used coal in a while, uh, but rather a decline in oil demand. Um, and so here's a really uh, fun data point for you. Tesla became a company in uh, July of 2013. Four years later, Tesla actually surpassed General Motors uh, in market value. So that proves to you how quickly and how disruptive new technologies are actually coming on board. Three months after Tesla surpassed General Motors in market value, you began an incredible domino, again, a domino effect of car companies that had been investing into um, electric vehicle uh, technology, but had not announced that they were going electric, but that, frankly, they were forced by the market to say, okay, not only are we investing, but we're actually going to move all our models over to electric vehicles, and each of them giving a hard deadline for when that is going to be. The first, of course, because we're here in Norway, was Volvo, uh, very quickly moving over uh, to all models being electric. Thank you very much to all Norwegians who are driving electric vehicles. Um, but then you also had Jaguar Land Rover, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen. Well, honestly, what could they do, right? Hello. Uh, I mean, you can't, you know, first cheat on emissions and then begin to say, okay, we're going to have less emissions. No, no. If you cheat on emissions, then you have to go to no emissions, right? They didn't have any other option. Um, but then you go to General Motors, uh, Ford, talk about iconic companies, Daimler. Um, and just yesterday, I read uh, Rolls-Royce is also saying, right, you know, we've got it. Uh, we're going over to uh, 100% uh, uh, electric uh, models. And I just came back from the most exciting, I know nothing about motorization, I know nothing about motor sports, but I just came back from my very first race in Paris of Formula E. For those of you who don't know, those are electric vehicles that race in the streets of capital cities, and they can do so in the streets because they are so silent. Um, so it was really quite fun. I was sort of watching the cars go by because they go by at 280 kilometers an hour, but I was also turning around to look at mostly all the males in the audience who were like, 
where's the noise? <laughs> so there is a little bit of noise because the cars do go against the, uh, against the air. Um, but because they're clean and not as noisy, um, now we can have uh, motorsports in the, uh, in the cities. Uh, and it was quite, uh, quite an amazing thing to see actually the excitement of young people. Okay, and that's something that I really think we have to take uh, into consideration. The next generation is totally with uh, a new technology, and they, they, they just don't have any patience for the technologies that we're used to anymore. Um, so electric vehicles, uh, projected cost parity by 2020. How incredible is that? How incredible is that? And on the regulatory side, again, Norway beating all, uh, all the records. Uh, Norway already regulating that all vehicles being sold as of 2025 will have to be electric. But then Scotland coming in, of course, three years earlier than UK because we have to have that little competition. Uh, and then now uh, we also have the Netherlands, France, and India. Okay, to my point also about developing countries. India already regulating that all vehicles sold in the Indian market will have to be electric by 2030. Uh, and China already saying, hmm, India got there sooner than we did. We better establish a date. So they are about to establish a date. And then we have a long litany of cities uh, that are either uh, restricting uh, diesel, such as Oslo, or restricting cars, such as Oslo. Um, and, uh, and of course, electric buses just, uh, just hitting the ceiling, in particular in China. What does all of this mean? Here is what it means, independently from the, from the data points that we now have a virtuous cycle that has started and is completely unstoppable, where you have financial risk understanding, meeting technology, innovation, and price drop, meeting policy support, meeting consumer demand. And once you get those four operating and mutually supporting each other, you have what I technically call an exponentially twirling, that's my, that's my uh, technical term, uh, an exponentially twirling virtuous cycle that is completely unstoppable and will only increase in speed. So all of that to the good news. Now, does this actually mean that we're on track to address climate change? Well, sadly, no. The fact is that decarbonization started not early enough and despite all of this excitement, uh, is not progressing fast enough. So I would like to give you, since the Paris Agreement, three science points that science points out to remind us that we are still not doing our job. Point number one, and we've already heard Concentrations in the atmosphere higher than the history of humanity, temperature records being broken, we, we know all of that. What is the effect of that? Well, three actually very concerning effects. First, last year, all the hurricanes that we got, in addition to being a higher number, had the highest wind speed ever, ever in the history. Think developing country destruction highest wind speeds ever for hurricanes. Secondly, the melting underneath the surface of the Antarctica has already started to slow down the circulation of currents around the planet that actually keep our temperature and our seasons more or less stable. When that goes, folks, we're in such big trouble. That, that, that is like stopping our own blood circulation. And we know what happens to us if that stops. Uh, very, very dangerous threshold that we're almost at. Um, and uh, for those of us who, uh, who are scuba divers uh, and lovers of the ocean, last year we already lost 30% of the corals of the Great Barrier Reef, never to be built again. Gone forever. So three data points that have happened just in the past 12 months uh, that science is very concerned about and therefore is reminding us that we actually need to speed up. Now, my favorite scientist, Johan Rockström, demonstrated what we have to do with that with a little piece of paper. So I now feel scientifically empowered to do the same for you. 
Um, so Johan says, okay, since that is the case, and we are still emitting 40 gigatons, 41 actually gigatons uh, per year, here is what we have to do. Let this little piece of paper be 40 or 41 gigatons that we are still emitting per year as a planet. Uh, by 2020, we have to put ourselves in the position of being able to half that so that by 20, per decade, so that by 2030, we will have 20. By the 10 years after that, we have to be able to have that again. So we're now in 2040. Uh, and by 2050, that's where we have to be with a maximum of emissions of five gigatons. And I will remind you with many more uh, brothers and sisters on this planet by 2050 and with much more economic growth that needs to happen in developing countries. What does that mean? That means that we have to be much more resource efficient, much, much more resource efficient than we have to be. We have to extract from every gram of carbon that we have much more productivity and much more benefit for the human race. But it also means, frankly, that we have run out of atmospheric space. We can no longer, we can no longer continue the trend that we have of continuing to increase the emissions in the atmosphere, she has said no more. She is full. Think of it as a bathtub. Think of the atmosphere as a bathtub where we only have a little bit more space to fill up, and then once we fill up, the water runs over with huge consequences. We only have 600 to 800 gigatons total to put up in the atmosphere, not for my lifetime, not for the lifetime of my children, for the history of humanity. That's it. So we are hitting very, very concrete uh, limits there, and we have no more space. We have run out of time. What does that mean? This is what it means. It means no more new well, coal, forget it, right? We've already sent them, you know where. Coal is gone. Oil and gas, very importantly. No more new drilling of oil and gas. No more new drilling. No more new licenses to drill. That means all the existing oil and gas wells that are currently under production need to be used because gas is the most important partner to renewables right now while we still don't have storage, okay? Very important part to renewables. They need to firm up renewables. They need to provide baseload. Existing wells, not new. We cannot afford any more new wells. We need, as humanity, to fight the natural decline of oil wells. And we know that the decline at a rate of five to maybe 10% uh, per year. That is the natural decline. Of course, there needs to be some investment into those existing wells of water and you know whatever else is done to extract as much as possible from each well. But let me be very clear. We cannot afford any more new wells. No more drilling. And here in Norway, let me speak to the Arctic the iconic, absolutely iconic uh, oil and, uh, and gas. Um, let me say, actually, with all love, because I do love this country, with all love and respect, the Arctic is simply undrillable. As simple as that. Those wells that are there now need to be used to their maximum extent. Those companies that are there now need to protect their shareholder value. But even if, even if we know that drilling in the Arctic is being done in open waters, that it is being done as safe as all the industry can, that it is cheaper than others, that production costs are going down, and that it would be in the most responsible hands the fact is that new wells and new oil uh, in, uh, in the Arctic has proven to be 
an elusive promise. Uh, it is a very promising geographical area or geological area, but it has proven over the past few years to be an elusive promise. We have not uh, struck uh, there uh, as easily as we thought. But even if we did, even if we did, oil and gas companies should at this point, I just got a red, isn't this, isn't this amazing? I just got a red light. I don't think the red light is for me. I think it's for others. <laughs> Thank you for the red light. Um, oil and gas companies uh, really need to be, at this point, incredibly strategic. They do not want to go, you know, the fate of coal. Uh, they have to be very strategic at this point. They have to understand where are they going to put their capital expenditures and where their operating expenditures. Operating expenditures should definitely be invested into where into existing uh, oil wells and, um, and infrastructure in order to make that as efficient and low emissions, methane leakage uh, reduction, as possible in order to be able to produce the stabilizing and firming energy that is absolutely critical for the next few decades. And CAPEX should be used, and we're looking at increasing oil prices right now. So very interesting moment for the enlightened oil and gas companies. CAPEX and growing CAPEX should be used to transition into the new economy. Nobody is benefited by oil and gas companies doing the Kodak thing. Nobody is benefited by that. All of us are benefited by oil and gas companies transitioning their expertise, their knowledge, their engineering skills, and their capital, and their presence worldwide into the new economy. That is what we're all benefited by. That's what their shareholders are benefited by. That is what the world is benefited by. So it seems to me that we actually owe a huge amount of support to oil and gas companies that are making that transition as long as the understanding is no new drilling. Um, that's difficult, I know, but uh, remember the bathtub. We are within a limited carbon budget. As I've pointed out, three scientific proof points that we are no longer playing house. Rather, we are endangering our house. We cannot do that. We have to be responsible. We, the adults, right now, are the ones that need to make that decision. That is not a decision and that is not a transition that we can actually delay, nor can we pass that decision on to future generations. It is ours to take and we can. Thank you. Thank you for being so direct about the task we have ahead of us. We'll come back to this in the you know, most controversial issues in, in a few minutes in the panel discussion. I just have to ask you one, one, one question first, and that's, you know, you're presenting a very optimistic picture. Stubborn optimism, relentless optimism. When I switched on my Twitter account this morning, I saw coming in from, from China news about how the, the Chinese energy sector is, has been per, per, performing now in, in the month of April. Coal is going up, uh, renewables, yes, but coal is growing you know, fast. We saw the, the last year uh, CO2 emissions globally increasing. We see how the, the Trump uh, administration is pulling back for example, um, uh, fuel standards. A lot of varying things also going on in the, in the global landscape if we talk geopolitically. How, how can we maintain optimism despite all the bad news coming in? Well, first we of all, you have to be stubborn. Shut right? First, you have to be stubborn because, as Kristen says, you have to decide 
which side of history you're on. That has to be a decision. And yes, you know, I've just drunk some glass, so I can choose, you know, I can choose to also read all the bad news and fall into despair, but I don't. I choose to read the bad news, understand that there are challenges, because to every story that you present, China, you know, is still using coal. Yes, it is. It has been using coal for the past 50 years. It is also the number one pro producer of solar panels. It is also the number one producer of wind energy. Um, and it is now self-defined the leader of the ecological civilization because they want to be competitive since there is another country that decided they don't want to be do it. China has decided they're actually going to produce the uh, low carbon uh, products and services that the world wants. Uh, so to every, you know, and, and to, uh, to everything that you tell me this is the bad news, there's always something positive about it. The fact is that humanity is in one of the most challenging and deeply rooted transitions that we have ever had. And this is the fun thing about it. It is a transition that is being led by our decision and by our policy and by our mind. All of the other transitions, the Industrial Revolution was actually a, a revolution that was led by the discovery of fossil fuels and then the development of the technology to use those. So it was market-led. This transition is policy-led, and it is being supported by, uh, by industry and by technology. So it's a very different transition, but it is a transition. And you know what? All transitions are messy, and we are in the middle of the messiest part of the transition. I welcome the messiness because it means we're actually doing something about it. If it weren't messy, we would have a big problem. Good, thank you. <laughs> we'll, we'll, have, we'll, have a, we'll have a couple, couple of uh, questions from the, from the audience. Um, and uh, Tarje Osmundsen, uh, Tarje, you have for many years been working with solar energy devel development, mainly in the global south, please. Microphone. Thank you for sharing your inspiration and for those of us who have been working on the ground for many years, it's always fantastic to be, to be uh, reminded of part of history we are, are part of and, and where we're going. I just would like to share with you some que a question regarding how we can actually help the developing countries who have not yet discovered the demise of coal to actually come to the same conclusion. Yeah. And I would like to give an example. I, this, this week and I came back from Sri Lanka. I went over there to a seminar with the inspired uh, information that, that, Nor the, that Sri Lanka with the support of Norway and the World Bank and everybody had decided to become 100% renewable by 2050. And when I come there, I discovered that actually the country is in a deep tug of war where the trade unions, the, the, the utility, is actually in a slow motion action against the utilities, the utility commission, because the utility commission say we're facing out coal. So actually the pressure now is, with the support of the president recently, to start building new coal power plants in Sri Lanka. And it's the same thing in Vietnam, it's the same thing in Bangladesh, it's the same thing in Kenya, it's the same thing in Ghana, those very countries that five years ago signed the declaration that they were going to be 100% renewable in a separate organization, they are now relaunching coal plants. It's not because of bad will. I think we have to understand the situation. They are looking at the, what they pay for emergency power. They're paying a lot for importing fuels. So they say, what can we do? So my question to you is, if we share your vision and we want to accelerate, what can a country like Norway, what can players like this do actually do to help those countries to avoid those terrible decisions that they are now facing, whether to restart the coal uh, investments? Thank you. So um, you had a list, I think, of about four or five countries. I could add, add about 20 more countries that are in the same, <laughs> in the same situation. And, um, I always reflect upon myself when I hear about, you know, our countries in a hard time and I go, hmm, okay, on the 31st of December, of last December, I actually signed a commitment to myself that I was going to lose 20 pounds. Have I done it? No. Okay. That doesn't mean, you know, that my commitment is any less. It just means it's darn difficult to do it. Okay. Um, so 
I don't judge those countries, right? I don't judge those countries for, uh, for not having done what they're committed to do. I think it's up all, to all the rest of us to support them and to make that transition easier for them. Uh, uh, and I think there are several components. Number one, uh, I think they do have to, and most of the ones that you mentioned, do have a very clear um, mapping of their renewable and domestic sources. I mean, that's the other really important thing, right? Renewable energy is by definition domestically sourced. So they're not importing, they're not using very expensive uh, currency that they have to purchase to purchase energy in. So first they have to expand everything that they can into uh, renewable energy with the support of finance. And I think there is a very important role for sovereign wealth funds, for pension funds, to really actively look at where can they finance renewable energy in these countries at actually very interesting returns, first point. Secondly, all of those countries will turn around and say renewables are wonderful, you know, we can use our own currency, it gives us more independence, and they're not from, they're intermittent. So that's where it comes to the point of actually being able to put together integrated packages of as much renewable energy as possible firmed up by gas. Because once you have that package, then you really have a very, very interesting competition to coal. Um, and you begin to move into, uh, into the direction of 100% renewables. But all of that needs first the analysis done, the financing done, um, and the very important integration between those two. And I know that I, you know, at, at some point, I'm sure I'm going to have to get, you know, a, a, a bodyguard because renewable energy people are going to begin to want to kill me because I'm very, very publicly saying I do think that we need to marry gas and renewables in the short term. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Uh, I'm a bit scared. Uh, from the, she's, she's, Amabet is, is uh, working at, at ELO, the, the Norwegian Confederation of Trade Unions, please. Thank you, and uh, thank you for um, your continuous inspirations. Um, it is obvious that uh, many sectors and industries will have to go through major transformations in the coming decades. Um, in the Paris Agreement, parties made uh, a commitment to a just transition for workers to the creation of uh, quality jobs and decent work. Uh, just transition policies connect employment, social, economic and industrial policies to the climate goals. And uh, just transition processes clearly count on social dialogue and um, involvement by the social partners and also tripartite cooperation. So do you think a lack of ambition and public engagement for achieving the climate goals may be caused by um, um, clim climate policies not taking into account social and economic realities and a just transition uh, in a coherent way? And if so, what in your opinion needs to be done to address this? Thank you. It's a very important question. Um, and I, I would say you're right um, in saying that we haven't paid enough attention to it. Um, I think it's something that is beginning to be corrected now. Uh, and the, I think there is no sector uh, where the urgency of just transition is as evident as in the coal sector, um, because that is the sector that is, you know, leaving us. Uh, and it is absolutely not fair to just because the resource is exiting the energy uh, matrix, it is not fair that uh, uh, coal workers. Uh, com um, communities, families uh, actually pay the price for that. It is just completely unfair. So uh, there is actually quite a bit of progress on, uh, on beginning to segment which types of communities, families, and workers need what kind of support because we will understand that some of them need support, the younger generations um, need the support to train 
out of coal into other uh, productive, uh, uh, other productive uh, employment. Um, and the older ones need support until they can retire with dignity. And, um, and, and very often, and I'm, I'm thinking now actually of a coal mine that is being closed, a coal mine and plant that is being closed in, um, in Spain where Iberdrola, the, the company, has actually put a very, very interesting program in place for all of those workers to help the closing of the plant. Um, because it takes several years to close the plant. And by that time, there will be a retirement age. Um, now, that says nothing about the black lung that many of these workers have. That is a permanent injustice.